Welcome back. All right, in this section, there's a couple spots in the documentation I wanted to draw your attention to so that after you watch the next couple segments here, you can kind of drill down into the next level of detail and refer back to the, the docs easily if you need to. So just here from the homepage of the creator's site, if you drop down into the docs section and then hit authoring, there's a section down here if you scroll down a bit called practice sections. And I just wanted you to see where that is because uh, the next thing you're going to see me do here is go into Heartstrings and add some practice sections to the song in Reaper, which are key to making something called auto-generation work, which is um, a way that without doing a whole lot of work on the front end, we can get some decent-looking camera cuts and lighting cues and other animation effects going on the song without having to stop and do all that work before we can even get a get an early glimpse of the song in the game. So I wanted you to just see um, where practice sections are, are detailed and then the other thing that you're going to see is the process of setting up the song's data using the magma utility and that's all covered here in the magma section and this is just showing exactly what I'm about to go through in the next section here and then once the song is built in Magma, the next thing that will happen is we'll transfer the song over to the 360 console and play it in what's called Audition Mode, which is built into Rock Band 3. And down at the very bottom here, there's a link to a separate page that is specifically about Audition Mode and all the controls that are available in there. Um, when you're doing this yourself, after about 5 or 10 minutes of experimenting with the 360 game controller, you'll have a pretty good sense of what's available to you to do, but if you need a, a reference to the complete list of features, you can always take a quick look at this and uh, refresh your memory. So in this section, we'll look at packaging the song up using Magma. That's a utility that Harmonix provides, where we load in all the song data. And then we use Magma to transmit the song to the Xbox 360 console, where we can test it out using something called Audition Mode, which is built into Rock Band 3. And then that file that we generate in Magma is also what we eventually upload to the Rock Band Network for formal playtesting and peer review once the song is uh, completely finished. So Magma has a special feature um, called Auto Generation. And what that does is it allows us to temporarily auto generate camera cues, lighting cues, and avatar animations um, as kind of placeholders so that we don't have to go through and manually do all that work before we can see the song um, somewhat up and running in the game. Eventually we'll go back and customize all that um, so that it's exactly what we want. But auto generation is a great feature when you're still developing the song to just help kind of move things along. But before auto generation will work, we need to set the names of our practice sections, which we do here in the Reaper file, using the events track. And Rock Band has a feature called practice sections where basically if a player is stuck on a certain part of a song on a particular instrument, they can go into practice mode and zero in on just that one section of the song and play that part over and over again until they master it. And they can slow it down and, and, uh, and so forth to get used to it. And um, in the past, those practice sections were auto-generated for us uh, by Magma, but now with Rock Band 3 and Rock Band Network 2.0 functionality, we're able to set those um, the names and the starting points of those practice sections ourselves. And so we do that right here in the events track using text events down here in the bottom area. And essentially what we do is we listen to the song and we decide where we would want each of the practice sections to begin and then we just give it a name down here in the text event area. So if you watch the previous episodes you may notice that I've swapped out the count in with some hand claps that actually come from uh, the song itself, so it's a little bit more natural than um, the hi-hat sound that I had in there before. So the first practice section for the song is basically going to be the intro, and that starts right here at the beginning of the third measure. So I just double-click right on where I want it to go. Um, I make sure that this little drop-down menu here is set to text events, so that I'm getting the right type of event down here. And then this top drop-down menu is preloaded with the names of all the possible practice sections we could ever dream of wanting to use. They all start with PRC, and those are these are basically just cosmetic names that we can give to uh, our practice sections. So I'm looking for PRC intro.
And this particular song has an intro that actually kind of falls into two parts. Ordinarily, I would just pick PRC intro. But a player might want to just play one or the other of the parts of the intro, so I'll, I'll break it up into two parts. And I'll call this first part PRC intro A. So the keyboard kicks in here at measure 11, so that's why I would want to give, um, give that its own name, because if a keyboard player is wanting to practice the intro, um, they'll get annoyed if they have to sit through that first part where the keys haven't come in yet. So this is where I'll start the first verse, and for the verses and choruses we need to give them each a distinct name, otherwise they'll only show up once on the menu that the player is choosing from. And in a song like this, where the performance really is different in, uh, in the different iterations of the verses and choruses, they'll want to be able to practice those separately. So instead of just choosing PRC verse, I'll choose uh, PRC verse 1. And this song actually has kind of an unusual structure. She has a, a section that, that follows the initial part of the verse that ordinarily I would think of as either a bridge or a pre-chorus type of section. But um, then it just goes back into the second verse again. So I think I'm actually going to break her verses up into um, A and B sections. So we'll call this first one verse 1A. So this is where it changes, so I'm going to go ahead and call this PRC verse 1B. So on uh, measure 44 here is where she starts kind of riffing around and getting ready to go back into the second verse. So I'll actually, um, I'll give this a third name so that players can practice this part on its own if they want to. Then it's back into verse 2 there at that point. So I'll go ahead and edit out, finish up the rest of these practice sections, and then uh, we'll link back up again when it's time to load this into Magma. Okay, so I've got all my practice sections in place now. I'll close out of here, do a quick save, and then I'm going to export my MIDI project again so that that new information is included. All the same settings as last time we did it, just clicking OK. And now I'm ready to open up Magma. So Magma is really simple. It consists of these three tabs. The Information tab, where we're going to put in some basic metadata about the song, the cover art, and so on. The Audio tab, where we're going to browse to the finalized set of stems that we rendered out from Reaper that are mixed and ready to be fed into the game. And then the Game Data tab contains a few additional items, including that MIDI file that we rendered in Reaper that will contain all the playable MIDI notes, difficulty tiering, and a few other items that we'll come back to in a couple minutes. So on the Information tab, I'm just going to go ahead and start entering the information for this song. In terms of genre, 
Magma comes with a set of high-level categories and then a set of subgenres underneath each of those. And Clara's music seems to classify as sort of acoustic folk, but that's not really one of the choices here. So I'm going to go ahead and select sort of a generic pop rock classification. And then what happens is once you get to the point of submitting the song to the Rock Band Network and it's going through playtesting with the community, there are some folks on there who are really knowledgeable about musical genres and difficulty tiering and issues like that where you may have trouble uh, making a judgment call. And they'll be able to give you feedback that will help you align your song in a way that's consistent with all the other um, thousands of songs that are uh, already in the system so that you're essentially creating an experience around your song that's consistent with all the other stuff that players are already used to. In this author field, um, you don't want to just put your name in there because the system uh, is actually going to check that field when you upload the song um, into the playtesting queue, and that author field is going to need to contain the username that you use on your Rock Band Network Creators Club account. And if those two don't match, you'll actually get an error, and um, the system won't be able to extract the package successfully. So I'm just going to go ahead and put in my username on uh, the Rock Band Network Creators Club. As far as price, there are three preset pricing levels, and these are in terms of Microsoft Points, uh, which are kind of a prepaid international uh, exchange rate free um, currency that people can uh, purchase around the world and 80 Microsoft points was probably uh, at least in my experience the most commonly used pricing point for um, Rock Band Network songs under uh, the original specification now that we're working with um, three-part vocal harmonies and keyboards it's essentially doubled the amount of work involved so I've kind of noticed a trend towards pricing songs at 160 that have all those features, but not all songs do. So it'll just kind of depend on what your situation is. And then there is a third pricing tier there for songs that uh, that maybe have something really unusual going on or they're uh, uh, longer than normal or things like that. So it's it's just another judgment call. And then the release label field, you want to leave that blank unless you are um, working with a label. And that scenario has some extra considerations and some constraints associated with it that are really outside the scope of this tutorial. They can be done and people do it all the time, um, but it is a little bit more complicated. And so if you have questions about that, feel free to email me or uh, post, post questions in the Creators Club forum. And there are people who are a lot more knowledgeable about that than I am, but it's, um, it's certainly something that, uh, that can be done. But as long as the song is independently owned and there is no label in the picture, then you definitely want to leave that field blank. This field down here that says Build To is asking for basically a file name to put on the finished um, RBA file that gets built after we run the compiler and, uh, and it creates the, the playable song package. So I'll go ahead and browse to uh, the folder where I want it to land. And it's just going to be called hardstrings.rba and that is different than the file that we're looking at here which can actually be edited and, and is the file that we would come back to if we wanted to make modifications to any of this later so this is actually a good time for me to go ahead and save this file which is the rb proj file so I'm going to do a quick save as I'll save it right there in that same folder And this will just be heartstrings.rbproj, and this is the actual editable um, Rock Band project file. And then the last thing on this tab is the cover art. And I've got that stored right there in that same folder. And now we're ready to move on to the next tab. Baby, it's easy to believe 